Good evening. Hi, I'm Dan Allison. I'm an area rep for District 8. And uh, we're very excited to have you here for our third annual uh, District 8 FCA banquet. And it's, a, it's just a really exciting time in District 8. There's a lot going on. Uh, many of you already know that Andy Lynch is going to be coming on our staff. Uh, he's on part-time right now. He's been a volunteer for a number of years. And he's going to be coming on part-time 25 hours a week starting June 1st. He just got back from uh, training in Kansas City this week. So we're excited to hear what went on with that as the board is. And uh, he's moving tomorrow. So they got a lot going on in his life. But we're very excited to have him coming on with FCA. And there's just a lot of neat things going on with that. Uh, just a lot. The goal of FCA is to minister to coaches and athletes and everyone who they impact about the message of Jesus Christ. And uh, it's really exciting to, to see that happen in our area. And with Andy coming on staff, we're going to be able to reach a lot more coaches. He's already getting a coach's Bible study starting down in Mercer County, working on that down there. Uh, we added nine new schools already. Uh, Shelby County is now part of District 8. Uh, I used to say we were District 8, but we have seven counties. Now we're District 8, and we have eight counties. Uh, nine new high schools coming in, and that's really exciting. Uh, again, just the impact that we can have now is, is, just, is just taken off. And uh, when I think of uh, impact that we can have, uh, people that have been honored, this is our third year doing this, and some of the people that have been honored have gone off and gone to college, and we happen to have one of them here tonight, and uh, Sarah Klum is down here at the front table in, in orange. She's a, so, uh, excuse me, she's a yeah, sophomore at the University of Finley. She's the president of their FCA, and uh, we're really excited about that. We also have another person that was recognized uh, last year, uh, Carly Sammons. She's going to be a sophomore next year up at Bowling Green, and she's going to be the president of FCA at Bowling Green. So students that we are impacting right now in our area are going off and impacting other areas. So it's really neat to see the, the reach and the impact that District 8 is having. And uh, it's just, uh, as far as being someone that's involved with it, it's just, uh, it's really neat to see. Uh, with Andy coming on staff, we're already, he's talking about getting huddles up at Bluffton. And one of our honorees, uh, Aaron Runk from Alanis, is helping him to get that going. So that's, that's a neat story. And we, not only is Aaron helping, but we've had a number of the people that we're recognizing that have helped us to get huddles started. Uh, you can see uh, Josh Boquist uh, helped us get a huddle started at Lima Senior this year. Uh, that was huge and uh, made a great effort doing that. Kim Etzler last year helped us to get a huddle started at Crestview and did a great job leading there. We also got a huddle started this year at Lincoln View, and Julie Thatcher, who we're going to recognize tonight, uh, was part of that. So it's just uh, neat to see what's going on uh, with District 8 and what's happening here. We're also excited to have Chris Norman as our guest speaker. I don't know if you got a chance to check our website or get on the Internet, but I really want to encourage you to get on the Internet and check out Chris Norman. Uh, he's really an inspiration to me. I happened to get a chance to get to know him a little bit more today, but uh, when I first saw this, it was really inspiring to me to see, and I'm not going to try to take away his testimony, but uh, he is really a follower. His heart, his passion for our uh, uh, Lord and to see him glorified is just really encouraging to me, and I just uh, look forward to you getting a chance to hear his story and to, to see that, but it's just... Uh, People always sometimes say, well, what do you think about the next generation? Is there hope for the next generation? And when I look and see what's going on in our high schools, when I see young men like Chris Norman out there, I'm really excited. I know that there's a lot of issues, but folks, there's a lot of good people coming up, a lot of great kids, and uh, fortunately, we get to work with a lot of them. All right, let's give a round of applause to the folks in the kitchen, and they grilled it all up, some wonderful chicken. Uh, let's say thank you. They do a great job each and every year, and I want to thank our board as well, which is ever-growing. We're looking for more board members uh, throughout, and we're going to form different ministry teams where you can have different focuses, uh, whether it's coaches or campuses. There's lots of different things we want to do over the next few years, and so if you're interested in hearing more about that and becoming a board member, but we want to thank the board who's doing a great job uh, to continue to push forward. I learned at FCA training that most areas have a staff member first and then the staff member goes out and gets the board and so when it was my turn to share I said well we've had a board for 20 years 
and I've only had a part-time staff guy the last two years, and they just looked at me and said, how does that happen? How does, how's their board in the area? It's because there's been such a belief in FCA for those two decades from guys like Tom Geeskin, Mark Schein, Mark Miller, Dan Allison, Wayne Minning, Marty Klum, Dwight Allen, Dean Brown, and so we're just so thankful for these folks who are coming around FCA and are serving, because that's what FCA is all about. It's about the volunteers, the ministers that are going out to minister, like the video said. We're very excited about that. We've got two special student speakers tonight. Then we've got a huddle leader speaker, who uh, just started at Liberty Benton, Connie Lyons, and so we're gonna hear from her later. And then Chris Norman will be up. But first, we wanna hear from our student speakers. And the first one done with his food was Matt Barr from Kenton. Not, <laughs> Cam's preparing still. Cam, that's going to be our second speaker. But Matt finished his food. And I remember Matt back in his freshman year. Garrett C. Wright was working for TV44. And he went to Kenton to do the football playoff previews. And, of course, Matty Mock was still around then. And I guess Garrett was looking for Matty to do the story. But Matty had gone home. And so Mike Mock was, was there in the, the locker room, perhaps, or the school. And Garrett said, well, I need to do a story. You know, who's here? We'd like to do a faith story. And Mike looked over. And I guess Matt was just a freshman at the time. And... Mike said, Matt, well, you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, don't you? Well, why don't you come up here and share about it with Garrett? And so Matt Barr was introduced to TV44. And for the last three years, he's been doing a great job of leading the Kenton FCA huddle along with some of his senior leaders. We'll hear about more from them tonight. But I want to hear from Matt Barr from Kenton. Give him a round of applause. Thank you, Andy. And, uh, Thank you to Dan Allison, all the District 8 board members uh, for putting us on. Uh, they do a great job for us. I'd also like to thank my uh, fellow honorees tonight. Uh, this wouldn't happen without guys like you, girls like you, athletes like you, people that are willing to put uh, Christ first in your life and willing to go out and make an impact in your school's form. So I just want to first thank you guys for uh, going in that fight with us. So uh, when I was asked to speak tonight, uh, they wanted to talk about what FCA means to me. And so uh, I was thinking about it, and there's three things that came to mind that my FCA huddle at Kenton High School uh, has for me. And I've been blessed to have a huddle uh, led by Matt Dudek back there for the last four years of my high school career. It's been a great mentor of mine and a great leader and has given us a great opportunity. But uh, first, FCA for me is my place of escape. Uh, every morning, every Friday morning actually, at uh, 7 o'clock, we meet in our high school uh, choir room. And uh, Fridays are a big day for me. Football is my passion and I played uh, football my last four years of high school. And I've been lucky to be on some pretty good teams. And uh, teams that made it to like the uh, state championship game my sophomore year. State semifinals my uh, senior year. But the other thing with having a good football team, there's a lot of pressure there. And uh, a lot of stress. I know nights, like Thursday nights, when I come home from films at 8 o'clock, I don't sleep. I don't sleep all night. I'm up. I'm going through plays in my mind. I'm reading film. I'm, I'm going over my playbook. And I'm just like, I'm trying to prepare myself. And so I get up on, at 7 a.m. And I'm just like a nervous wreck. Like I can't sit there. I'm jittering. I can't eat, but uh, I get to FCA, and uh, the first person I normally see is Coach Dudek or my pastor, who's one of the leaders there, and it's like just a quiet feeling, like I get to see people I'm like accustomed to, and are there with my faith, and then we start singing songs, and our songs are like, if our God is for us, who can be against us? We start singing uh, Strong Tower, and all these songs, they're just like talking about how God's with you and going through it, and it gives me a little peace of mind, because I know that when I'm going out on Friday nights, when I'm taking that field, that my God's behind me, and that's just kind of what FCA has been for me. It's been an escape where I can just like let all that stuff go. I can quit thinking about the game for a good 45 minutes and just focus on my relationship with Jesus Christ. Because sometimes throughout the week, I mean, I'm preparing for football. I sometimes like I let my uh, football take over my life. Sometimes I'm not there reading my Bible as much as I should. But Friday mornings are when I can reconnect with my God before my games. Second, FCA for me is a place to get excited. I love getting up at 7 a.m. And most people are like, 7 a.m., are you crazy? You guys going that early? Well, yeah, we're excited to get up that early. I'd be good enough to go lift otherwise, but we get to go be there and have, like, just a great time getting jacked for Christ because that's our time period where we get ready to go. Coach Dudek always talks about it's like our halftime. It's where we get to go back in, regroup for the week, and get ready to go for the next week. And as we get excited there, like, we had some great speakers this year and the great speakers throughout my four years, and I got to hear people like, uh, just great seniors that I looked up to, like Bryce Fackler, Matty Mock, Coach Mock, who has been a role model of mine. We get to hear people like that, and it just gets you excited because you get to see people that you're going to battle with every day for your Lord and in your high school, and you just get to see how they're interacting, and it just gives you, like, I don't know, it just gets me revved up, and it gets everyone else revved up too. 
But the biggest thing I think for FCA in my group is a place of outreach. And FCA is a place where you bring, to people, you bring together people who normally aren't worshiping together. I mean, Kenton's a small town, but we still have tons of churches. I mean, I go to the Nazarene. There's the uh, First United Methodist, Christian Missionary Alliance, just to name a couple. And those kids are spread throughout, and we don't always get to worship together. But on Friday mornings, we come together as a collective group, and I get to worship with them, which is really cool. And the other thing is, it brings together kids who normally wouldn't come on a f Sunday morning to church. I have a lot of football friends, a lot of guys who aren't Christians, a lot of guys in the locker room that are doing things on Friday uh, after the game that I don't want to be a part of. I know that I've got friends who like to go out and party, and I can't be there with them because that's not what I'm supposed to be doing. I've been raised where I'm not supposed to be doing that stuff. And so I, when I go up and ask them, hey, you want to come on Sunday morning and want to come worship with me? And they're like, no, man, I'm, I'm going to have a hangover or something. I can't, I can't be there. I'm going to be so partied out. I'm like, well, I'm sorry. I, I hope you can come some other time. But I know that my football guys, they can't have that stuff on Friday mornings because we got a game that night. I know that's important to them. So it's real easy for me to say, hey, come worship with me on Friday morning. Why don't you come in? It's going to be an easy time. There's going to be free donuts. Who doesn't like free donuts? Come in. Bunch of, you say that to D lineman or O lineman, they're right there. It's real easy to get those guys to show up on Friday mornings with free donuts. But FCA is just a way to get your foot in the door. I don't know how many times, I don't know how many people we've got to come to Christ or got that breakthrough on a Friday morning. But that Friday morning is planting the seed. I know that. I've seen people from the start of my freshman year who I didn't think were ever going to make it to a Friday morning. I mean, I asked, I asked my friend. He played the same position as me for four years. I, played, I started with him in seventh grade, and we worked our way up. And I'd never gotten that breakthrough where I could even get him to come to FCA. He was a kid that would go out on Saturday nights and would party and stuff, and I'd be like, hey, man, just, just come with me to FCA one time. Just come see what it can do. And he'd always be like, no, man, Matt, I don't want to come. I don't want anything to do with that. Well, just recently, in January, I was like, hey, it was after football was over. I'm like, hey, come with me one time. And he was like, all right, I'll come see you. I'm like, I'll save you your favorite donuts. I'll make sure you get them there. And he was like, all right, we're going to come. So he comes. He sits there, and Coach Dia gave the sermon. And he started talking about how we're champions on the football field. Like, you can be a champion on your athletic field. And that was really appealing to that kid because he loves sports. He's like, why can't you be a champion in your other life? And so this kid, I could see the look, like the, work, the wheels turning. And he's like, all right. I'm like, we'll be back, be back next week. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to come back. So he came back the next week. Same thing. I think I even gave the message that week. And I talked about how there's sometimes you've got those things that are beating you down in life, whether it's a class or like a relationship that can just be beating you down and how God wants to pick you up. And how when you're holding on to things like this by yourself, you can't always hold them up. And then when you let it go and let God take care of it, how much he can help you. I remember he looked at me after that and was like, you really believe that? I'm like, yeah, I do. He's like, all right. So he kept coming. And then I was slowly but surely, I'm like, hey, why don't you come to my church on Wednesday nights? And so he'd show up and he'd go to youth group with me. And this kid starts to make this change. And then I'm like, why don't you come to a Sunday morning with me? And this kid's like, Matt, I can't, I can't get out of bed on Sunday morning. He's like, how am I supposed to get there? I'm like, just come with me one time. Shows up. And he comes. And then next week he's at FCA and he's like, Matt, I, I really like this thing that you guys are talking about. I really like this Christian thing. And I'm like, all right, just keep coming, man. Just keep, just keep plugging in. That next Sunday, we're standing there in the front row. And uh, there was a group of us, a group of football players, that like to sit in the front row at our church. And we're sitting there and the pastor gives an altar call. He says, I don't know what you've been dealing with. I don't know what demons you've been dealing with. Why don't you just all come down? And if someone comes, come pray with them. I'm sitting there, and I'm not expecting much. I mean, we know how altar calls go. Normally, some older adult gets up and goes down, and no one really follows. But, like, I'm just standing there. I'm, like, I'm like weighing back and forth, like, oh, let's just get this over with Pastor Dave. Let's just get moving here. Everyone's uncomfortable. Let's just get going. No one's going. No one goes down. I'm like, all right. And then right as the song's getting ready to get over, my friend starts walking forward, and he goes to kneel down. And I'm looking at my friends like, we got to go. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> and all four of us, there was four of us, I remember, we go walking down, we put arms on him, and we're, we're touching him, we're, we're praying with him, and I'm just like, come on, I'm like, buddy, I'm here for you, I'm here praying with you. And this kid, I've played with him for four years, kid broke his arm his eighth grade year, didn't cry, kid's one of the toughest guys I know would never cry. Tears start rolling down his face, and like, I'm, I was crying too, I, can't, I could barely keep it in, 
and my dad came down, my pastor came down, and Coach Dudek was there that day. He flips flat facts and forth between two churches. It was luckily there that day. We had half the congregation, our teachers, my assistant principal goes to our church. We were all down there surrounding this kid. And my best one of my best friends is sitting there, and he's committing his life to Christ. It was one of the coolest things ever. And I don't know if getting him to FCA was the breakthrough point, but I know it's when we started playing the seed. And that's really what FCA is to me. It's where you can plant seeds in someone's life that can be an impacting change for the rest of their life. Because I know that kid was going down the wrong path. And it wasn't anything I did. It wasn't anything that Coach Dudek did or anyone else did, but it was something that God did. I think that that's how God works. He uses something as great as FCA to get his mission out there. And that's just what FCA has been for me for the past four years. Thank you. Wow, that's awesome. Thank you, Matt. That's what FCA is all about. Stories like that. Leaders like Matt reaching kids that need Jesus. Another guy that's been a leader is Cam Etzler. Sophomore year, I went to Crestview and said, we need, we need FCA here at Crestview. And I met with him and Coach Lotzenheiser, the track and field coach. And Cam brought his notebook, I remember. I brought pizza, and we just kind of sat around a table. So this is what it looks like to have an FCA. Over the past three years, Cam has just taken Crestview by storm. And now he realizes, we did an interview with him this past winter for our prep profile. And Cam said, I, I realize now it's more about than just me being a basketball player, but I can use basketball for God. Cam Etzler, senior at Crestview, state champion of basketball. Come on up. Thank you, Andy. And uh, Matt, that's, a, that's an incredible story. That's a very inspiring story for uh, anyone not only involved in church, but anyone that's uh, been around during a uh, religious transformation as uh, your friend went through. Um, as Andy stated, I, uh, I started FCA around my sophomore year. Uh, we didn't have an FCA when, we, when I was in Crestview, at Crestview. Um, around sophomore year, Coach Lotzenizer said, hey, uh, hey Cam, uh, Andy Lynch is coming in here and uh, wanted to know if you guys wanted to start an FCA group. I had some uh, friends that went to Van Wert that were, I had, uh, came really close with, and they had explained it to me how it's uh, basically church at school since teachers can't technically lead it, which we all know they somehow find their way in there. Um, but um, he, he said, I'd, I'd really like to see you come down here and uh, hopefully uh, kind of help me along with the transformation that we could get one started. <laughs> um, junior year, we started about uh, November, I think middle of November was our first meeting. And... Uh, we were kind of nervous to see how some of the students would accept it. When we uh, came in, there were about 35 students, which Crestview being a small school, we were, we were pretty pleased with the numbers. Um, and then around the second time uh, we had our meeting, we had, I think, about 65 members. So obviously word had spread pretty quickly, and uh, Mr. Lotz and I, and I were obviously uh, very pleased with the outcome. Um, about junior year around basketball season and a little bit around uh, sophomore season, uh, I was going through some emotional things, whether it was uh, teams, uh, having issues with teams, teammates, uh, academics, some issues with uh, teachers, uh, and I kind of hit a wall in my faith that really, really challenged me, not only uh, through FCA, but also uh, just getting it through to myself that uh, I really had to trust the Lord, and I had a I had a conversation with uh, my uncle Ray Etzler, who is a longtime coach at Crestview, and uh, I was assuming we were just going to have a, a nice basketball conversation. That's usually how most of the conversations went. Uh, I came into his house after practice, and he uh, sl started uh, talking about basketball, which is where I thought it would lead, but the conversation eventually turned, and the first question he asked me is, how is your prayer life? And... Uh, I always knew he was a very religious man, but uh, hearing those words from him really uh, kind of challenged me, and um, I was very ashamed by the answer because I knew it wasn't very good whatsoever, and uh, I, was, I was very kind of emotionally shocked by what effect it had on me, and I, I frankly told him, I said, Ray, Ray, it's awful. I, I've completely gotten off track, 
and uh, it's not where it should be. And one thing that I can remember like it was yesterday that he told me, he said, Cameron, no matter what you're in, whether it's in academics, whether it's in day-to-day uh, -day life, whether it's basketball or baseball, he said, you always have to put the Lord first in whatever you do. And that was one thing that stuck with me ever since. Um, two months later after that happened, uh, I had a conversation with uh, my pastor, and it was a uh, April 7th, 2013, uh, I was baptized at my church. Uh, I was never baptized as a child. That was a, a choice that uh, our family had made because uh, we wanted to make sure I really knew the definition of being baptized and how it affected me, affected my image, and what the true purpose of it was. <clears throat> uh, when it came to that, that's when I really firmed up my faith, and I remember uh, talking to Andy and talking to Coach Lawson Heiser about all the things that had eventually went into my decision in making the FCA. And I still remember uh, meeting Dan Allison at uh, McDonald's and Van Wert, going over all the things, getting that thick booklet of FCA things to do. <laughs> um, but the relationships is what I've really uh, became very, very uh, pleased with. Not only, not only pleased, but also just kind of very proud of how it is. Uh, we've had a lot of teachers and coaches speak throughout our time that we've had it for these last two years. And the relationships and kind of seeing the other side of what these coaches and teachers are uh, experiencing, it kind of forms a bond between you, not only a, a teacher-student relationship, but also a fellow believer in Christ and how uh, they're going about their day-to-day -day life and how they... Uh, they know how to deal with certain situations. Uh, one specific one that stands out to me is uh, our coach, Matt Perkins. He was uh, part of the Bluffton baseball team that had the, the baseball crash, uh, the bus crash when he was on the baseball team. And I still remember we were standing in the auditoria and he just absolutely broke down in front of 35 high school kids. And he said, he said I hadn't prayed in probably three years. And he, it just, all the emotion just flooded out. And it was good for us students to see that because we saw a different side of a coach, of a teacher, and for most of us, a friend. It, uh, it kind of translated that you never know when your life's going to change, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse, but you always have to have God on your side. And that's one thing FCA has really brought out in a lot of us is that you have to, you get to make those connections with people and some of those connections can eventually lead on to bigger things. You don't know when someone's going to have their better day or they're going to have their worst day. Um, we were talking during a meeting, and a student came up to me after and said, Hey, Cam, uh, you talked about you being baptized. I was wondering how I, could, how I could get into that. And that's probably one of the best things I've ever heard, being related into FCA. And uh, it just really makes you uh, proud to be a Christian not only uh, you're seeing someone else succeed, but you know that the, the greater things that are in store for what they have. Um, I'd like to thank my parents for, uh, for the constant influence that they had on me. And uh, I'd like to thank all you guys for uh, the constant support you guys are putting in in your school and uh, the FCAA board that has uh, started this great tradition in uh, District 8. Thank you. Thanks, Cam. Thanks for being real. That's what we're all about. Not just putting on a front and being good Christians or whatever that looks like, but being real and being genuine. And when we're hurting, having someone to go to, a, a teammate, a classmate, very special. Liberty Benton High School started an FCA this year, and Connie Lyon, a coach at Finley for girls basketball up until a couple months ago, going to spend some more time with her family now, but she's been at Finley coaching and then also leading the Liberty Benton FCA, and so we want to hear her thoughts on the first year. Connie Lyon. Well, Cam and Matt, I would love to have you come and talk to my kids at home. Where are you guys at? Where are they sitting? Weren't they wonderful? I, th that just, I'm pumped up. And I could, I could use word awesome, you rock. If my children were here, they would say, Mom, you need to use different terms. That was back in the day. Now I know why my players would always say, 
what does that mean, coach? And I'd have to explain from my era what that meant. So we do thank you. I, I'm, I'm excited uh, just hearing the stories that you've shared. Uh, I, I did coach at Finley High School. Um, and the reason why I work with the Liberty Benton High School program and middle school program is because that's where my children go. So uh, I started and wanted to invest in uh, their school where my kids are. And hopefully, and I ask you to pray for Finley High School. I would love to see something happen there. It's very difficult for me to stretch uh, as a mother and then as a coach, a varsity coach, to, to do it all. Um, and, and, uh, but we, we feel like God's going to raise some people at Finley High School. So we ask you to pray for that school. I would love to see some great things happen for those students there. As far as Liberty Benton, I uh, just wanted to share with you uh, a little bit of focus on our middle school program, which is a little different. I know many of you have been involved in the high school program. Um, I do want to first take a step back. How many of you have ever received a text in the last month that has said, God's not dead? Anyone? Okay. If you have received a text that has said, God's not dead, someone has probably been in the movie theater and they're watching that movie, God's Not Dead. I encourage you to see that movie. And I'm going to take a clip from that movie, uh, and I will not uh, be a, no, there's no spoiler alert, but... I will share with you, there's a a moment in that film where there's a pastor who's a local pastor in that area where the film, uh, where where the stories are occurring. And then there's also an international pastor, a pastor who is visiting that that pastor from overseas. And they are trying to take just a day trip to an amusement park to get away, just just a day trip. And they go to the pastor, local pastor's car. He turns the key and it doesn't start. And uh, they thought, okay, we'll get a rental car. Rental car appears. They bring it in. The gentleman just drove it there, parked it in the church parking lot. He sits down, starts, tries to start the engine. It doesn't turn over. They go to car number three. I think they end up with car number four after a couple days. And as they're standing there and they're looking at that car, they're a little apprehensive. They're thinking, will it start? will it not start? Does God want us to stay here another day, or will we get to leave? And as they stood there, his friend, uh, the gentleman from overseas, they had their bags sitting beside them. He said, you know, let's put our bags in the car. And he's looking at him like, well, why? You know, this could be strike four. You know, he's thinking to himself, why should we put our bags in the car? Because it's probably not going to start. And then the pastor said, you know, we've got to show God that we have faith. So we're going to put our bags in the car before we try to start this car. So they put the bags in the car, and he turned that car over, and the engine hummed, and off they went. So I think about the students in our schools and the fact that you just got to take a leap of faith. And sometimes you have that bag, and you, and you just put those things in it, and and you, and you push it through the door, and you've got to be ready to go and just see what God, what, what God has in store for you. For us at Liberty Benton, it took a mom, and I want to address the parents. I know we've had two students speak, and I want to address those adults who really have, uh, have so much influence, who provide so much, who uh, provide great home environments, who help raise these kids. And I think about this mother that I was meeting, and I meet sometimes free, uh, with, with moms in the community um, periodically through the course of the week. And this is a mother I had never met. She wanted to meet. We sat down. She said, I'm a little apprehensive. I have children who are, who are entering school. Uh, Connie, is there anything there that uh, uh, a school organization where they can get involved in that would encourage them in their faith and help them as they become you know, stronger Christ followers? As we're sitting there talking, I said, you know, at at Liberty Benton, at this time, there's really nothing there. We do have a YFC that that meets the needs of some at-risk kids, but but nothing that's that's really thriving in the school. And uh, she said, well, what, you know, what do you do at Finley? Or, you know, I know you have a ministry there, even as a coach. Uh, At a public school, you still have a ministry there with your players. And I said, yes, but, you know, as far as at... at, um, uh, at Finley, that's where I'm at. I'm with those kids all the time. 
at here at Liberty Benton, they don't have anything. I, I, and I said I was an advisor for FCA in Indiana for a period of time. She's like, oh, really? And she said, what is that, Fellowship of Christian Athletes? And I said, yes. So we talked about it a little bit more. She asked a lot of questions. And then finally she said, and looked across at me, looked me in the eye and said, Connie, what is stopping you from starting one at Liberty Benton? And I looked at her and I didn't have an answer. My first thought was I'm busy. I've got too much on my plate. I'm a wife. I'm a mother of three kids. I'm a varsity coach trying to, at a big school, trying to run a K-12 through program. There's no way. She looked at me again. She said, Connie, what is stopping you from helping get this started? So I started to come up with a list for her. And every time I came up with something on my list, she had an answer. I'll take care of that. What else do you need? Well, I think we need, a large, we need to make sure we have parents, a big group of parents, that will provide food, that we know we have the support base of the parents in the community. I think that's a very important start right there. Okay, where do you want to have that meeting? Your house or mine? Every time I came up with something, Julie came back with an answer. We had a meeting two months later in my home with 20 parents in the community that we invited and said, hey, will you back this group up? Because we were going to start it in the middle school. So we knew that parents were very instrumental in being a part of a middle school group because they don't drive. And we needed that parent support group. So we got their commitment, and it was a meeting asking for commitment, asking for them to play roles in, in getting this organization started and initiated at the middle school. So with that support base, we went ahead and started our huddle meetings, and we averaged 40 to 50 middle school kids on Friday mornings. We have a huge Christmas bash uh, for an outreach, and then we had our first spring event two years ago where 80, children came, or 80 kids came, filled the football field, and we had the messiest games on the face of the earth. With flour, shaving cream, mud, we worshiped God, and we had the opportunity to see some kids come to know Christ that day. So what a great thing, because a parent looked me in the eye and called me out and said, we are not busy enough to do these things for these kids. So I encourage you, I know the high school movement is a great place to start, but if you're high school movement and you have the FCA there, why not get something going in your middle school? Because those kids are facing things that, that at an earlier age, and they need to have a solid foundation in their faith that uh, you can have a big impact on them in their faith now. We have our high school students. We started our middle school two years ago. We started our high school organization just this year. We have our high school uh, students come over in the morning to mentor our middle school students. So we've tried to bridge that gap and create um, a full um, school system, FCA. So I challenge you to do that. If you need any, um, uh, any help with that, if you need us to just share with you ideas and ways that, that we got that going in the middle school, I would be happy uh, to talk with you. We're already talking with a school nearby about that right now. But I'd be happy to do that. Since I resigned from my coaching position, I guess I have a lot of free time. So, but I thank you for this opportunity, and I do encourage you and challenge you. I listen to Cam and Matt, and I'm pumped. I'm ready to go out. Let's start five more. I mean, we, we have, uh, we've got some, uh, you know, some great students here who are going to do some great things. God's going to work through you in some wonderful ways. But we do encourage you, think about your middle school. Think about what you can do to get those younger students involved in FCA. Thank you. There's lots to do. <laughs> I'm excited just uh, thinking about the opportunities and, and just what a great picture that is of what our schools can, can get to. So many great things are happening right now, but we, we aren't in a lot of middle schools, and that's a great place we can go. Uh, as Dan mentioned, I was in Kansas City 
This past week for FCA training, as I go on staff, there's our class picture. 70 people from across the country came to Kansas City for the week. And I was sitting next to, to Big Mike. I think he pronounced his last name Mackin or Macon. Uh, he's here on the side. He's probably 6'5", 300 plus pounds. Uh, played for the Dallas Cowboys in the 80s, or at least was on the, the, the roster, had some injury problems, was on, with the Jets as well. And we were just talking, you know, about uh, some other guy, I don't remember who, who had left football to go pursue a ministry. And he says, this guy named Chris Norman from Michigan State is doing the same thing. And I said, he's our banquet speaker on Sunday. Chris Norman from Michigan State. And he said, oh, I've seen this video. we got to connect. Mike's going to bring a bunch of ninth graders up from Atlanta, Georgia. This big former lineman is mentoring freshmen that are the next level college players. He said, all these guys are, are going to be college players. You know, they're that caliber of guy. He's bringing them up on a trip, and he's gonna, we're going to connect them with Chris. We're going to bring them over to the TV station and practice interviewing. You know, these types of relationships are what FCA is all about. And Chris Norman's amazing story that make Big Mike excited, we get to hear tonight. Chris Norman from Michigan State. Uh, thank you. I really, I really appreciate that. But I have to admit that I am uh, uh, somewhat intimidated because I heard that I am virtually surrounded by Ohio State fans. <laughs> um, <laughs> so if this will sort of uh, soften any possible animosity you may feel toward me, uh, please consider that we do have a common enemy, okay, in the, in the, in the, the University of Michigan. So... <laughs> Uh, thank you. But, but with that in mind and with, and with that being said, I, I want to uh, briefly say that my heart is very, very warm about what's happening in this room right now. Uh, nothing gets me going. Uh, nothing motivates me. Nothing uh, brings me more joy than to see the body of Christ mobilized uh, and to see that within the lives of our youth. Oh, my goodness, it makes me want to cry. Uh, so, so I want to thank all of you guys who are involved in FCA, especially you students that have been reaching out to your classmates, that have been reaching out to, you, to your teammates. I want to thank you personally uh, because they need to be reached with the gospel and we need to be the hands and feet uh, of Jesus Christ. So I want to thank you for that personally. And with that in mind, uh, before I uh, dig into the work of God that he has been doing in my own life, uh, could you all please, uh, please bow with me uh, briefly? Father, I thank you so much for the blessed opportunity that you've given me to be here this night. Lord, I thank you for your son. I thank you for your word. I thank you for sports. And I thank you for giving people the thoughts and the motivation and the heart to do something like FCA. Lord, I pray that as I explain your story in my own life, uh, that your name is ultimately exalted. I pray that your name is lifted up. I pray that your glory fills this room. Lord, I pray that the Spirit of God uh, in, empowers me. Lord, I pray that you give me the clarity of thought, that you give me the clarity of speech. Lord, I pray that you touch my heart and touch my lips so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart can be acceptable in your sight. Lord, I pray that we all leave encouraged and motivated and spurred on the good works as we continually walk with you. And in your son's name, Lord, we all do pray. Amen. Okay. So in order to understand uh, my own testimony and what the Lord has done and is doing in my own life, you need to have a little bit of background information. Uh, and me, I was born and raised in the city of Detroit. I'm sure you all have heard about the city uh, to one degree or another. Uh, but something that you may not know is that uh, there are churches all over the place. Um, if you walk down a block, you may see two or three. And if you walk down the next block, you may see two or three more. Uh, so externally speaking, the city of Detroit could be uh, seen as a very religious place. And me, myself, I grew up as a very religious kid. I was very familiar with church culture. I was familiar with the scriptures. I was familiar with the gospel of Christ Jesus. If you asked me to present the, the gospel, I probably could have did it. Uh, if you asked me what a few uh, Bible verses says, I probably could have said them. I knew what it meant to go to Easter programs, to Christmas programs, to Mother's Day events, and any other uh, pseudo quasi holiday that anybody can make up and go to the church and be involved in it. I knew what it meant to go to Bible studies and prayer meetings. I knew what it meant to go to the actual service on Sunday. 
And, and I knew what it meant to be surrounded by uh, people who love Jesus. But if I were to be frank, and if I were to be completely honest with you, as I grew up in this particular background and context, my heart grew harder toward the truth. My heart grew harder toward the gospel. And my heart grew harder toward the person of Christ Jesus. And as I got older, and especially as I got to a lot of you guys' age in high school, I intentionally and ultimately rejected Christianity. I intentionally and ultimately rejected Christianity. And the reason why I did that, uh, I can explain it to you in two ways, two categories, one internal, the other external, uh, inward and outward. Externally speaking, I had a misconception. I was under the impression that Christianity was about liturgy. I was under the perception that Christianity was a matter of dress. I was under the perception that Christianity was a matter of attendance. I was under the impression that uh, God was only interested in one particular kind of person. I thought that Christianity was simply about uniformity. I thought that it was about conformity to a list of rules. And it never really clicked with me that Christianity was more about a person that you follow. And the reason why that is so, uh, quite frankly, is because the type of church that I grew up in, for example, we weren't allowed to wear shorts. And that made it very, very difficult when you wanted to go to Cedar Point during the summertime on a vacation with the church. We had to have a certain sort of haircut. And there were all sorts of weird rules that added to the gospel. And in doing so, it stripped it of its power. It stripped the gospel of the purity of grace. It stripped the gospel of the purity of faith in the one true God and his son, Jesus Christ. And with this in my mind, I rejected it because I wanted to have something personal. I wanted a God who was interested in me, not just what I wore. I wanted to be involved in a faith that was about not eating and drinking, but peace, righteousness, and truth in the Holy Spirit, like it says in Romans chapter 4. And I didn't necessarily see that. And on top of that, I didn't think that you could have joy being a Christian. I didn't think that you could have joy being a Christian. I thought that once you uh, really wanted to get involved in this faith, you had to go to this place every week, and that was it. I didn't necessarily think that it affected every single area of life outside of the walls of the church. And that's just externally, but there was also some things internally that kept me from the faith. And if I were to be even more honest with you, one of them was idolatry. Uh, let's face it. Uh, all of us were given a capacity to worship. We were literally made to worship. We were made to worship and, and know the one true God, but because of sin, we rebel against that. And I did. I broke the first commandment. You shall have no other gods but, uh, other than me. And I worshiped myself. I exchanged the truth of God for a lie and served the creature as opposed to the creator. I looked at myself as my own God. I followed what I wanted to do in my own life, and I rejected the one true living God who made everything, the heavens, the earth, the seas, the mountains, the rams, the goats, Cheerios, and Frosted Flakes. <laughs> I rejected that God, and I worshiped me. And I didn't just worship myself, but also worship my sport. Because from a very early age, I started playing football when I was nine years old. I realized that if you were good, and anything really, but especially if you were good in sports, you could easily get a lot of attention. You could easily get a lot of people patting you on your back. You can easily win acceptance. And I fed into that. And at the rejection of an amazing, beautiful, magnificent, glorious God, I worshiped little old me in a football. And that's not the way that things were supposed to be. But luckily, in 2010, my sophomore year playing at the University of Michigan State, we played against another very, very good university in Alabama. And if you're any kind of college football fan, you know that that is a very, a very good football team, and I think they're cheating in some way, shape, or form. <laughs> but with that being said, we, we played against Alabama in the uh, Capital Wombo in 2010. And very early in that game, about the third play in the first defensive series, I went down with my first major injury. 
Uh, I had broken a, a tendon in my tricep and also messed up my UCL and my elbow. And to this day, I still don't really know what that is, so please don't ask me. <laughs> but, but I went down with this major injury, and, and at, the, at the moment of a second, everything that I had built my life on, myself and my sport, was taken away just like that. And looking back at it in retrospect, I thank God that he allowed that to happen to me because it forced me to consider a few things. One, the meaninglessness, the meaninglessness of a life apart from Christ. I consider what it says in Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds a house, the builder builds in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman watches in vain. Or consider what it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, vanity of vanities, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And what's very interesting about that is that the person who penned those words was King Solomon. He was the wisest man on the planet. He was the richest man on the planet. And he had a whole lot of wives. And you say, well, see, you know, if he was the wisest man in the world, why did he have approximately 900 wives and concubines? I don't know. (laughs) But that's what the scriptures say. And he was wise. And he had everything that he could ever want. And he was the one who said, vanity of vanities, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And the truth, no matter how unfortunate or depressing it may seem, is that once we leave this earth, there's going to be nothing but us inside of a box. And after death comes judgment. And I was confronted with the reality that I had built myself on something that couldn't last. I couldn't rely on myself. I was a terrible God to to, to be worshipped. I couldn't sustain life. I can sustain my own life. And also realize that football in and of itself was also a terrible God. Because it could be taken away from me at any moment. And I realized that all of those people who smiled at me and, and, and who congratulated me constantly, that could be gone at the drop of a hat. Because all of a sudden, because I was injured and I was out from the sport, I didn't get it. I didn't get those interviews in the media. I didn't get that extra TV time, and I was forced to watch for the first time in a long time other people enjoy the sport that I had built my entire being and sustenance on. So I was confronted with that reality. That's not to say that anything, uh, any of these things are wrong, but it's wrong when you make them your idols and they take the place of the one true God. And I was also confronted with the reality of my own sin. Because I was born and raised in the church. I I, had known about Christianity. I'd heard the gospel constantly. I'd heard Jesus Christ preach faithfully for a long time. And I knew that what I was doing was wrong. I knew that I was living a life that was woefully contrary to the law of God. And, And I knew that I was living in such a way that wasn't consistent with what he had revealed in his word. So I was convicted of my own sin, and I sensed my need for genuine salvation. I sensed my need to know Christ. And it was that moment in my life where I started to seek that truth that I had learned and heard so long. I started to seek it again, and God pursued me. God pursued me because at Michigan State University, the director of Athletes in Action, that is the ministry that I was involved in, he kept on talking to me about this Christian camp out in Colorado called UTC. It stands for Ultimate Training Camp. And given the predicament that I was in in life, I finally listened. And to tell you the truth, if that did not happen, I would not have gone to that camp. And when I got there, I saw something that I had never seen before. I saw people... Other athletes, much like yourselves, love God. I saw them worship God. I saw them enjoy God. I saw them enjoy loving other people. And I knew that the reason why they lived this way, I knew that the reason why they had so much joy and why they had so much love in their hearts is because they knew this Jesus. And they made him seem so personal to me. And they, they, they made him seem like, like that God who walked with Adam. They, they made him seem like that, like that God who let his glory reside amongst the nation of Israel. They, 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 they put that God who cloaked himself in the person of Christ Jesus and came to live amongst men. They put him on display. And they put that God who, gave, who, who literally gives his spirit to live inside of the people who know him. They put that God on display. And for the first time, I realized that 
Christianity isn't inauthentic. It's real. It's genuine. And the God that we serve is not interested in lip service. He's interested in our hearts and knowing him. And not intellectually, but genuinely knowing him. And once I saw that, for the first time in my life, I listened to the gospel that was preached one night. And I went back to my room. I considered everything that I had heard. I considered everything that had happened to me recently. And by the grace of God, Jesus was deemed worthy, worthy of repentance, worthy of turning from a life marred by sin and blasphemy, and worthy of being the Lord of my life. And it was that night that he changed me, and he made me a new creature and a new creation in Christ Jesus. And it was for the first time in my life that I experienced true joy. It was the first time in my life that I experienced true sustenance. And it was the first time in my life where I realized that there was something out here that transcends me, that transcends my sport. And it was the glory of God and the person of Christ Jesus. I realized that finally, and I felt so free. And that freedom hasn't changed. And Jesus himself said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And finally, I had known the truth, I accepted the truth, and I committed myself to the truth, and I was free for the first time in my life. So now, I'm a new creature, a new creation. I, I love Jesus. I, I go back to, to Michigan State, and I'm telling all of my teammates about him, and they see this change, so everybody looking at me like I'm crazy because I'm not saying what I used to say, I'm not going where I used to go, I'm not doing what I used to do because I've been made new, transformed. And I enjoyed the fact that you could worship God. And I enjoyed the fact that you could honor him in school. I enjoyed the fact that you could honor him in football. I enjoyed the fact that you could honor him in relationships. I enjoyed the fact that you could worship 24-7. Because like it says in Colossians 3.23, whatever you do work heartily is for the Lord and not for men. And like it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, whether you eat or drink, do all for the glory of God. And I enjoyed the fact that you could do this. So I'm going to rerun a little bit forward to my senior year. Uh, by the grace of God, I was able to be a captain on a defense that was pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. Um, and, and by the grace of God, a, a few things had happened as far as uh, football was concerned. I got invited to the NFL PA All-Star Game. I, I had uh, reached out, uh, multiple agencies had reached out to me. Uh, I'd heard from different scouts from various teams. And, and the possibility of going to the next level to play football was a reality. And I want to emphasize that it was only a possibility because nothing is guaranteed. I had a, a true a possibility for continuing my play in my sport. But I didn't take it. I didn't take it, and I chose to go to seminary instead. And I understand when I say that a lot of people look at me like I'm crazy. I'm completely used to it. It's okay. You're not going to offend me. But hear me for one second, because there are a few reasons that I'll let you know tonight why I did what I did. One of them was the desire. It says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, that if anyone desires the task of an overseer, he desires a noble task. And when it comes to the prospect of preaching and teaching the word of God, I can't divorce myself from it. In Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9, it talks about how the prophet, how the, how the word of God to the prophet is like fire in his bones and he has to get it out. And from one day, last year in January, I literally have not stopped thinking about doing ministry back in the city of Detroit because that's ultimately what I want to do. I have not stopped thinking about teaching and preaching the word of God. And I literally can't escape it. No matter what the situation is, I think John Newton says this a lot better than I can, uh, even though it's uh, cloaked in 18th century lingo, uh, but please bear with me. If you don't know who John Newton is, he's the author of Amazing Grace, a beautiful song, but this is what he said. A warm and earnest desire to be employed in this service. I apprehend the man who was once moved by the Spirit of God to this work will prefer it if attainable to thousands of gold and silver, so that, though he is at times intimidated by a sense of its importance and difficulty compared with his own great insufficiency, dot, 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 yet he cannot give it up. What that basically means is this. 
Like I said earlier, nothing separates me from the desire to do this type of ministry. Well, that's where it started, with the prompting of a heart. Next, the scriptures. What I mean by that is this. If you open up the pages of the word of God, and, and it's revealed on the pages of Holy Writ that multiple people throughout the course of redemptive history, lives were completely changed. The course of their life was completely changed. I'll give you just one example, the 12 disciples. Not all 12, but just a few of them. One, they were going about their own lives. Jesus walked past the boat, and he said, follow me. And once that happened, they dropped everything, and that's exactly what they did. And next thing you know, the entire world was changed. And, and, and not just about that, but, but consider this. I'm in seminary right now, and I'm surrounded by people who were former engineers, doctors, lawyers. As a matter of fact, somebody else is one of my classmates who used to play for the University of Michigan and went on to play in the NFL for the Denver Broncos, but he made a similar decision like I did. And it's not to say that everybody has to do that, but that is, that is to say that there are those cases where someone may be called to a particular kind of ministry, and me, I have the obligation to respond to that. So it started with a desire that it moved to the Word of God. Third, the church. And by the church, I don't mean these walls, I don't mean a building, I mean the actual people of God. I talked to the church. I asked questions to the church. And it was in the church, and it was by the church, that my gifting had been confirmed. In Proverbs, it tells us that in the presence of many counselors, there was victory. So me trying to exercise wisdom, I asked my brothers and sisters in Christ, what do you think about X, Y, and Z? And they said, I think that you have been gifted in such a way that makes this possible. So if this is what the Lord has for you, I don't think it will be too far-fetched because if you think you should do something but nobody else agrees with you, you may have a problem. But in this situation for me, that wasn't the case. Next, it was God's sovereignty. It was God's sovereignty, God's providence. And what I mean by that is this. So many things happened when I was making my decision. So many things happened. Just to give you one example amongst many. I got a call from a friend who knew a friend that offered me an internship. And in this internship, they would pay for my entire seminary education. And that would be analogous to somebody who wants to be a doctor, yet someone comes along and pays for the entire med school. It doesn't happen every day. And the reason why this is so significant, because for me, that was huge confirmation. And I'm not the only person that feels this way. I'll go back to what John Newton said. He also says this. That which finally evidences a proper call is a correspondent opening in providence by a gradual train of circumstances pointing out the means, the time, the place of actually entering upon the work of the ministry. And that's what happened to me. I guess to give you one more example, you can consider the fact that I'm here right now. I never really knew about the town of, of Lima before, but by the grace of God, uh, Mr. Geekson re reached out to me and I ended up being here today. And at the fundamental root of this whole decision-making process was my desire to be obedient, my desire to follow Christ, my desire to go wherever he wants me to go and say whatever he wants me to say. Because Jesus himself said that if you love me, you would do what I say. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. And, and me considering the fact that somebody approximately 2,000 years ago saw fit to die for me makes it logical in my mind to then listen to the same person. And that's what I ultimately want to do, not just with this decision, but in everything that I do in life. And that's to follow Christ. So what then am I saying? What's the point that I'm trying to prove by telling you guys what I did? Well, my consistent prayer, my consistent prayer from the very beginning was that people would see the value of Christ, was that people would see the value of Christ. I'm not saying that I think all of you should do the same thing. 
I'm not saying that football is bad. I'm not saying that going to the NFL is a bad idea. And I'm, I'm not saying any of those things in any way, shape, or form. So please don't hear that. But please hear that knowing Christ is worth more than anything that this world could offer. Consider what it says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. Indeed, I count everything as a loss. For the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for his sake, I suffer the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. So that is to say, knowing Christ, following Christ, intimacy with Christ is worth more than even life itself. That's my biggest encouragement to everybody, especially to the youth. I want us all to see the beauty of Christ. I want us all to see that the mandate that's on our lives to follow him. I'm not a perfect example, neither am I overly spiritual. I'm just a sinner saved by grace, and I want to respond to that grace that was given to me. And this was the best way that I knew how, and looking back on it, I wouldn't change anything that I've done. So that's my prayer for you, is that you know Christ intimately and realize that he's better than everything. And for those of you who may not know Christ, because I don't know the spiritual condition of everybody sitting in this room, I want you to know and understand that too, that you don't have to be like me and wait till you're a student in college. Or you don't have to be like me when I was you guys' age and I already had it in my own mind that I was going to wait till I was 60 years old to become a Christian. Because by then I could live my own life, my own way, and I wouldn't have anything else better to do. That's not the way to go. He's worth more than that. So my exhortation to you then would be to lay down your life and commit yourself to the truth like I did. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says that if we confess our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. But understand that when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you're saying this is the end of me and it's the beginning of you. I'm no longer my own. You're in control of my life. And when you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you're just confirming the fact that Jesus is, in fact, the way, the truth, and the life. That he rose from the grave. That he lives again. And that through him, and only through him, salvation is possible. And if you haven't done that, I want to implore you to do that tonight. But for everybody else, just please see that Jesus is worth it. He's so worth it. So with all of that being said, would you please bow with me again? Father, I thank you once again for your son. I thank you for seeing uh, that you saw fit to come here and send yourself to die on a cross to set us free of the very people who rejected you because, Lord, it was our sin that put you up on that tree. Father, I thank you that you rose again, that you defeated death, you defeated the grave, and there's victory in you. Lord, I pray that you give us the grace, give all of us the grace to understand how amazing you are, how beautiful you are, how worthy you are. Lord, I pray that everything we do in life, whether it's a relationship, whether it's school, whether it's a sport, all of it is submitted to you. That we don't have anything that we would say, God, I give this to you, but this area over here, I'm going to hold off limits. Lord, I pray that we all grow in you in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and we continually reach people with the glorious gospel, that wonderful message that allows people who are dead in sin to become alive in Christ. We thank you. We love you. And once again, you are worthy. And in your son's name, Lord, we all do pray. Amen. I think that's it. <laughs> We're going to present our awards now. So Tom Gieskin, the board president, is going to come up. Chris, if you could come over. Uh, to the table. Thank you so much for your words, for your life story, and for how you're following after Jesus' call in your life. It's awesome. If you 
are one of those that prayed that prayer for the first time to, to follow Jesus or to follow him anew, we want you to connect with somebody. That's so important. FCA, we hold the gospel up. We hold the cross up. That's what they pounded into our hearts all week long is that we are holding that cross up. And so we want to journey with you on that trip, wherever you're at in your spiritual journey. I encourage you to, to talk to a coach at your table, talk to myself, Dan Allison, someone on the board, and we want to journey with you. We're going to recognize some great, great student leaders this year. It's so encouraging to see what FCA is doing all throughout the area. And so when we call your name, come on up. Your award will be presented, and then we'll have everybody stay standing up here for a group picture afterwards. Uh, when the night is done, you can come up and, and get pictures individually with Chris if you want or, or whoever. Uh, Coach Damon Olm, he, he'd like to have some pictures taken with him too. I want my picture with you, by the way. So <laughs> anybody you want, you know, we've got cameras. First up from Ada High School, Caleb Garman. Come on up, Caleb. Wearing purple appropriately. Tim and Vicki Garman are his parents. Congratulations on doing great things at Ada as the huddle president. From Allen East High School, Aaron Runk. His parents are Beth and David Runk. Aaron, there he is in the Allen East blue. Let's see if we can continue that tradition with the school color being worn. He is the FCA president and helped start FCA's chapter at Bluffton, which we're excited about this year. We have two from Bath. First, Audrey Brandon on her way to Navy to be a soccer goalkeeper. Her parents, Tom and Becky Brandon, and she's a basketball and soccer standout. Also from Bath, Brian Jordan, who I called Byron so many times in the soccer broadcast, I apologize. His parents, Rob and Sherry Jordan. The R and the Y just get all confused, but great job. Columbus Grove, Brooke Schnipke, five years in FCA. She is, uh, her parents are Terry and Teresa Schnipke, so congratulations. <laughs> FCA officer and president. We have two from Continental. First, Kiana Warnament. Did I get it? Warnament? Yeah? Okay. We try. Her parents, Chris and Tara, leads prayer after soccer games in charge of getting a student to pray before and after huddle meetings. Uh, has never missed a huddle meeting. Continental, a relatively young group, doing a great job up in Putnam County. Also from Continental, Matthew Bracken. Come on up, Matthew, in charge of getting a student to pray as well before and after huddle meetings. He's never missed a message. Soccer, basketball players, parents Craig and Lisa. Thank you very much. We heard from earlier from Crestview, Cam Etzler. Come on up, Cam. His parents, Scott and Sandy. Varsity basketball, varsity baseball. President of Crestview's FCA. From Delphus Jefferson, Kennedy Ohm. Come on up, Kennedy. Her parents, Damon and Kristen Ohm. She's participated in volleyball and track. And a great leader for the Delphus chapter, involved in the weekly Bible studies as well. Great thing at Delphus Jefferson, they have the huddle meetings, but then they also have some more in-depth Bible study time uh, with Coach Josiah Stober. So a couple opportunities there for students. From Elida, Clark Etzler. Where are you at, Clark? There he is. His parents, Dave and Michelle Etzler, football, basketball, track. He's the vice president of FCA, junior. From Kenton, we heard him earlier, Matt Barr. Football, basketball, baseball, his parents, Brett and Amy Barr. Student leader for the last three years for the Wildcats. Also from Kenton, Courtney Fulton. Come on up, Courtney. We're in the Kenton Red. Three years in FCA, part of the student leadership team, band for four years. Her parents, Jason and Shelly. From Lima Senior, in the first year having FCA, Josh Boquist. Come on up, Josh. Football player, track. You're playing baseball too, aren't you? Yeah, baseball, okay. Doug and Debbie Boquist are his parents. Great job by Josh. From Lincoln View, Julia Thatcher. Where's Julia? We won't say Kaylee Thatcher. How's that? That's her sister. Julia's doing a great job. A leader at Lincoln View. She's just a junior. We have her mom written down, Joanne. So, good job, Joanne. From Macomb, Brenna D. Four years with the FCA leadership team. Volleyball, basketball, softball, track. John and Carla D. are her parents. Couple from Shawnee, Alex Clark. There's Alex, soccer player. He's the huddle president for the Indians. Two years at FCA. His parents, Mel and Karen. Also from Shawnee, Claire Dalkey. Two years uh, with FCA as well, vice president of the huddle, basketball. Her parents, Ted and Carolyn Dalkey. Dan? Okay, great. From St. Mary's, Amanda Dews. 
There's Amanda, the Rough Rider Gold Senior Class Representative, Cross Country Track Volleyball. Amy and Steve Dews are her parents. St. Mary's is a very exciting place to be for FCA. Always lots going on down there. They had a great volleyball all nighter just a, what, a month ago. So very exciting to see activities. A uh, relatively new program, Upper Scioto Valley, Cole Crawford. Cole's in the back coming up. President this year, Leadership Council last year. Was a member in 2011-2012. That was the first year for the school. Josh Spencer and company doing a great job. Scott and Mitzi Crawford are Cole's parents. And... I think the last three are not here, but we do want to recognize them. Wapakoneta's Carly Schneider, five years in FCA. She's a vice president. And then Waynesfield Goshen had their prom last night and their FFA meeting tonight, so they could not attend. But Mindy Brookhart and Jenna Whitaker are the representatives for Waynesfield. So thank you very much. Let's give one round of applause to all these great leaders in our schools. All right, thank you. You can go. Have a seat as we finish things up. We'll, yeah, yeah, we'll do pictures at the end then. I just want to share quickly, because one of the things we learned at FCA training was to be brief. <laughs> so I have a 30-minute show, you know, an hour 15 on Fridays. So we got some time, but not tonight. I just want to share quickly uh, just a brief snippet of our last year. A year and a half ago, God told my wife and I as we went on a mission trip to Mexico to feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. What does that mean? I don't know. It means something for each of us differently, maybe. Last summer, God was saying, what if I pull you out of TV? I said, God, that's all I know. <laughs> what else can I do besides TV? He said, what if I pull you out of TV? Is that okay? Will you follow me? Just like Chris was talking about. Will you follow me? Last November, after Thanksgiving, I was ready to go be a pastor <laughs> Yeah, me, <laughs> at a church in Galleon. I'd heard of Galleon. We passed it to cover track meets, and we visited the church, and they had me there. I was going to come speak a, a guest sermon and be their senior minister, this guy that's never been to Bible college and didn't go to class at Syracuse. I'm going to be your preacher. And I was ready, and they were ready, and, and we were, God told us to put the house up for sale, and so we did. He told us to sell our car, and so we did, one of our two cars. Met with my boss, Kevin, at the station, the general manager, and told him what we were doing end of November. And he, he said, okay, you know, we want whatever God wants. Week before Christmas, Dan Allison, trying to come on staff with FCA, trying to raise full-time support. You know, we have to raise our own support. And, and Dan says, I can't keep doing both, guys. You know, I either need to be full-time with FCA or, or just stay teaching at Wapakoneta. I can't do both. Dan was thinking about me before I even say anything. God was thinking about me before I ever realized it. So that week before Christmas, I prayed. My wife prayed. You know, I was about ready to go do a sermon to this church of 160 people, and they were going to, unless I swear, they were probably going to like me, you know? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe they wouldn't have. Maybe it wouldn't have worked. <laughs> but that's the intention that we got from them. They, they, they were going to have a pizza and chicken wing dinner the night before. Does that say love or what, you know? <laughs> And so I was ready. I was ready to go. But that week, God said, well, what if I kept you here? What if you did FCA and the TV station? You built up, your team has built up such a, a following at WOSN. People watch you for sports, and they hear about God along the way. What if you could do that? So I prayed. And that Friday morning, it was the 20th of December, I went to a park before Lee and the kids get up. And I prayed, and this was my day where I had to decide, you know, God, I, I don't want to leave these people at this church. I don't want to lead them on. I don't want to get there and then say, oh, no, I'm not going to do it. You know, I wanted to be fair to them before Christmas. And so Leah was asleep. I snuck out. I don't remember if you knew that I was going or not. Nope, she didn't. I went to a park and just prayed. And the first thing God said to me, we learned about leadings this week at FCA. And I, I, I've got so much I want to share, but I can't. So we learned about leadings. And God was leading me that morning. And he said, don't worry about Galleon. And I said, but God, who's going to take care of those people? We have a connection with them. We can help them. They're so hungry to go and serve and lead people to Jesus. What about them? He said, don't worry about them. I got them taken care of. So I had to let go of Galleon. We just heard a month ago or so they hired a, a preacher, and they're, they're going. God's taking care of them. So my next thought was, okay, God, well, well then FCA, is that it? And just as I was thinking that, Leah sent me a text. The day was the 20th. 
She had read December 21st. It says, my plan for your life is unfolding before you. Sometimes the road you're traveling seems blocked or it opens up so painfully slow you must hold yourself back. Then when the time is right, the way before you suddenly clears. Through no effort of your own, what you have longed for and worked for, I present to you freely as a pure gift. You feel awed by the ease with which I operate in this world. And you glimpse my power and glory. God was saying, this is your area. These are your coaches. These are your athletes. These are your fans. These are your administrators. These are your parents. I have you here. It's yours. Now go serve. That's what God's called us to do. He's called us to serve you. My wife and I were talking. She has a great ministry with Kids at Heart International. They send teams of people all over the world to evangelize kids. And we were talking, and I said, the great thing about FCA is if I'm doing my job as an area rep or area director, I'm not, doing, I'm not in the schools as much as I would like to be. You guys are. I'm not speaking at all the huddles. You guys are. They are all about empowering the coaches, empowering the students to show their classmates, their students, Jesus Christ. And I just get to coordinate all that. We've got so much to do. I am so excited to be in schools, to get things started, to grow the groups that we have and to come alongside you in any way we can. There's coaches' Bible studies we're going to be starting. If you're a coach, I want to talk to you afterwards about how we can make that happen in your area. We're not all going to be in Lima. You know, we'll go west, we'll go east, we'll go north, we'll go south. We'll make it work. We are here to build you up. You have such an influence, and we are so excited to use that. Through this journey, I need to raise financial support. And so there are little cards on your table. We need to put together a team so that I can do this. You know, the TV station is going to pay me my salary for the 20 hours I'm working there, but the rest of it needs to come from folks like you. And so I encourage you to pray about that, to think about that. At FCA training, they said we should ask everyone for $100 a month. And I said, really? <laughs> That's kind of maybe some people, but it's whatever God can do. It's however you feel about coming alongside. I'm going to be in Macomb in the middle of May to share with Macomb Church of Christ. We're going to be down in New Bremen to share with the churches of New Bremen and Minster, New Knoxville. Just God's raising it up. We need support. We need teamwork. We need community. I love what Liberty Benton did with the Booster Club for the parents. We need that everywhere, don't we? Kenton, how much would you love to have the parents coming alongside? And I'm sure they do, but even more so. How much would you love to see the booster club for the football team be smaller than the booster club for the FCA group? We're, we're just building into our kids. We are supporting them. So we encourage you, no matter where you're at, no matter how you're influencing, that you come, aside, come alongside us and be a servant, be a volunteer, be a booster club member. It's been a great night, hasn't it? How about Chris? Awesome. Awesome. Our student speakers, Matt and Cam, they're seniors. Guys, do you have one more year of eligibility? Can you hang around maybe? We're going to miss you guys, but there's, there's a next generation of leaders. We have juniors in the crowd. They're next. Clark Etzler, you're next. Other juniors, sophomores, freshmen, you're next. We're raising it up. One of our board members, Wayne Minning. It's going to close us in prayer. Then students and ath or athletes, come on up and, and get your pictures taken. And we'll be hanging around here. And just if we need to pray for, for you, if there's concerns on your heart, we want to do that. Or just talk. You know, we're here for you. So, Wayne, come on up and close us out. If you'll bow with me. Lord, I just want to say thank you for the testimonies we've heard tonight. Thank you for the young men and women who've been awarded here tonight and represented themselves and you uh, so well. We just uh, also want to say thank you to, to Chris and his amazing testimony. We just pray, Lord, to, just a strong blessing in, in, in what he has going forward. And Lord, I do lift up uh, and say thank you for all the, the family members that are here tonight supporting these young men and women, whether they be high school, middle school, uh, college. We just thank you, Lord, that they're there in, in helping to set the bar for, for their children and, and uh, mentoring. We thank you, Lord, for the huddle leaders. 
just uh, thank you, Lord, that uh, you brought those people uh, out. And, and uh, as Connie shared, that just uh, step out in faith that, that uh, it can happen. We just ask, Lord, that you continue to bless uh, FCA. Uh, thank you for uh, Dan and Andy and what they've done in leading uh, this district. We just pray a blessing on them as they uh, continue to go forward uh, with the support of the board and the support of the families and the huddle leaders. And we just ask, Lord, that you use FCA District 8, just use it to change lives. And, Lord, we want people to know and to seek the value of, of you, as Chris had said. We just pray, Lord, that you continue to bless uh, all the different uh, people that are here tonight and those that couldn't be here and those that are uh, involved in the school. And, and, Lord, you know what you want to do with this program. We just ask, Lord, that you uh, bring it to light for us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.